Welcome everybody and good morning. This is quite a crowd we have here for this Ready by Five conference. Uh, we have parents and we have early childhood providers, we have government people, we have funders, we have people representing education and health and the faith community. I think we've got just about every bucket checked and uh, that's exactly what we need to think about uh, our children in Kent County. But before I introduce our breakfast keynote speaker, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about a dear friend that we all lost this week, Susan Broman. Susan died earlier this week from complications from a brain tumor, completely unexpected and quite a shock and very sad for all of us. Susan was a tireless advocate for children long before she went to the state of Michigan to lead the office of Great Start. Susan's passion was for social justice at the core, demanding a sense of fairness about people. It was Susan who saw the inequities that children in poverty and children of color in Kent County were experiencing and demanded that we figure this out. The result is what we now know as First Steps Kent. I spoke with her a couple of weeks ago, gave her an update on where we were and how far we had come together, invited her to the conference, but she was too new after retiring to get her feet back in things. But we talked about how far we had come and we both beamed. In her work at the state, she worked hard to try to coordinate the numerous agencies and programs serving children. It was frustrating for her, but she kept at it. When we spoke, she was worried that she hadn't done enough. Imagine that. Susan's work with us spans over 25 years. In that time, we came to know her as direct, honest, caring, and tough. I don't think it's an understatement to say that we would not literally be here today, in this room, having this conversation, if it hadn't been for Susan and her tenacity. And so I'd like to dedicate our work today to Susan and to the future that I know that she envisioned as well. And now I'm delighted to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Renee Boynton Jarrett, who will be giving our breakfast keynote. She's a practicing pediatrician at Boston Medical Center, a social epidemiologist, I practice that word, <laughs> and the founding director of the Vital Village Community Engagement Network. She is featured in the signature hour of The Raising of America, the documentary, documentary series that is nationally recognized, as is her role and her expertise of early life adversities as life course social determinants of health. We are truly honored to have her speak here today. Please welcome Dr. Renee boynton Jaron. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I am honored to be welcomed to this beautiful city, and I truly mean that um, from the bottom of my heart. Sometimes you go someplace and you just feel like you're with family, and I've just been treated so warmly since I arrived. And um, from the moment I was invited to be a part of this, I knew that the work that was happening here was really for the right reasons. And I'm so inspired um, to just be a part of this day of kind of celebrating 
but digging deep to kind of move forward. So I want to talk a bit about networks of opportunity for child well-being. Um, I'm excited to be with the group that got up at 8 a.m. in the morning to come talk about child well-being and you know, children thriving. This is my tribe. This is my crew, uh, those that get up early in the morning. I don't have any disclosures. I'm not going to sell anything today. I mean, the only disclosure I have to make is this is not going to be a talk full of jokes and humor. I don't do those kinds of keynotes. So that's actually a joke that I just made. So <laughs> get your laughter out. <laughs> because there won't be many more coming. And uh, <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit this morning about community attachment and that concept. We're going to talk about ripple effects of the work we're doing and the work that's come before us and what's on the horizon for really promoting community capacity to improve child well-being. And so those are the objectives. But if you can hold in your head three themes that you'll hear throughout this talk, one is courage. One is conversation, and the other is connection. And at the end of the day, it's really these much more simple themes that are going to make the most profound difference in our ability to really move the needle for child well-being. So community attachment, what, what do I mean by that, and what really is that concept? So to put it simply, it's the bond that a person feels to the community that they live in. Um, why would we care very much about community attachment? Well, interestingly enough, the Knight Foundation had done a bit of work um, looking at the relationship between community attachment and GDP. And they found that communities where there was a higher rate of attachment, they not only had higher population growth, but they had higher levels of GDP. And so they worked with Gallup to figure out why would that be the case? And if so, what are the factors in community attachment that really push that along? So this was their, some of their results. So they saw that for communities that had higher levels of attachment, the GDP was significantly higher and the population growth was higher. So they moved forward. They worked across 26 communities. They interviewed over 43,000 individuals over a three-year period. And they looked at several particular drivers of community attachment. All of these are things you would think would be drivers of community attachment. How strong is the local economy? What are the social offerings? How is safety? What's a leadership like? What's education like? And do you know what they found to be the key predictors of community attachment? Oops. Openness was by far the key predictor of attachment, followed by social offerings and aesthetics. So let's dive into that a little bit. What do they mean by openness? How welcoming a community is to different people was the biggest driver of attachment. Not the local economy, not the school system, um, not social capital. How open the community was to differences. And it makes sense that that would be a key driver, in fact, because in order to have a successful school, you need a lot of openness. In order to have a successful, thriving economy, you need a lot of openness. The overall physical beauty and green space was a key predictor because we're social beings. We live within a social world. So how your neighborhood looks and your ability to experience the full range of the built environment is important. Opportunities for social interaction and caring with other citizens. So more important than the local economy is your ability to socially interact with other people. So when we look at these, we're not surprised by them because we're human beings and we're social beings and we care about each other. But when we talk about communities and community characteristics, these aren't the first things we usually talk about. And so community attachment was more strongly related to the perceptions of openness, aesthetics, um, and social offerings than it was to the demographic 
the demographic characteristics of these communities. The perceived quality of K to 12 education was incredibly important, but the majority of communities, over 75%, felt like that was low. Um, highly attached residents were much more likely to lean in, contribute to community growth. So why am I talking about community attachment? I'm supposed to be talking about child well-being. I'm supposed to be talking about childhood educational outcomes. Why does this matter? Well, we know why it matters. Because we know healthcare only explains about 10% of what produces your health. The majority of what produces your health are social and, economic, uh, social and environmental factors, as well as behavioral factors. These are the factors that appear where you live, work, and play. These are the factors that appear within your communities. So we have to understand how to improve and better our communities in order to truly drive better health and educational outcomes and life chances for every child. So the Center for Disease Control has, has, has talked about this and they've shared this me method, method, message. Social determinants of health, early childhood education, public transportation, Home, um, um, home improvement loans and grants are the foundation of what is going to produce the largest health impact over time. Next, changing the social context, improving school-based programs are another clear set of foundational practices that will lead to long-lasting health outcomes. And as was mentioned, I'm a pediatrician. Clinical interventions are tiny up here. <laughs> So this is the real heart of the work, and this is the heart of why folks are in the room. But there's another reason why I'm talking about community attachment, and that's because you guys are the early childhood folks, and we know that one of the most important things that happens in early childhood is your attachment to your caregivers. So we know on a fundamental level, attachment is a critical thing for children. And if this doesn't happen optimally, it actually causes a ripple effect of challenges later on. So in order for children to develop optimally and be ready for school, they need strong and secure attachments. Developmental progress simply will not be optimal if attachment and the environment that children are in is unpredictable, lacks a reliable, safe, secure base from which to then develop and explore the world. So a lot of the work we do is actually to support caregivers in their effort to care for their children, to attach optimally, and every professional in the lives of children. You know, but the story doesn't stop there because we also know in early childhood, brain development is happening in a way that it never will again, a rapid pace. So what are we looking at? We're looking at pen and ink drawings from 1906. These were drawn by Kajal, who was a doctor who won the Nobel Prize for uh, identifying neurons, identifying the cells in our brains, and identifying the fact that they work together in networks to communicate. <laughs> so he called these butterflies of the soul. <laughs> and in fact, because when he compared the human brain to the brains of animals, he saw that the presence of these interneurons was vastly greater for human beings. And in fact, we know now that if these interneurons don't develop well, we see a lot of challenges in development and functioning throughout life. The study I referred to by the Knight Foundation about community attachment was called the soul of the community. So I think we see a harmony here between networks and attachment at the community level, networks and attachment within families, and networks and communication within our bodies and ourselves. And it's a harmonious message for as we think about why we are together 
in this room struggling to connect our language, our programs, our missions, and our visions to better serve children, I think it's reassuring to see the presence of networks and the importance of networks in every level of the human experience. So these butterflies of the souls are just intricate networks happening on a tiny level. I was honored to hear about um, the unfortunate um, and untimely loss of your cherished partner and member. I also recently experienced a similar type of loss. This is Dr. Barry Brazelton, who is about 99 years old when he passed away three weeks ago. Um, many of you may know touch points or the touch points work that has been spread across the community. But although Dr. Brazelton may not be a mentor to you, I think each one of us in this room stand on the shoulders of someone else. And we stand on the shoulders of those who've come before us. And I find it inspirational and powerful to look at the ripple effects of that work that came before us as we're preparing to do the difficult and innovative work we need to do today. So one of the lessons or ripple effects that I bring into this space is how do we mobilize community resilience? Where does that come from? And how do our network efforts really work to support that? Well, really, we're really thinking about how do we build upon the capacities, the assets, the resources, the strengths that are already within communities to really impact the lives of families and children in a powerful and different way. And when we think about that, we really take a solution finding orientation to that work. Do we expect that despite challenges, communities already have identified and are activated on solutions, creative solutions to the social challenges that bring us into this room today. So if you change a deficit orientation to a solution finding orientation, you would expect that solutions are already within communities that can be grown and amplified, in part because you would assume that communities actually would be doing much worse than they are if there weren't already some solutions. Parents are making some good decisions and in ingenious ways working together. So we take that orientation to really identify assets that already exist within communities. I enter this work as someone who is deeply cared about the portion of children who've been exposed to chronic and insidious violence at the earliest stages of life. And when I think about the impact of those chronic adversities in early childhood, I think not just about the adversities that happen on an interpersonal level, such as child abuse or neglect or exposure to family violence, but I think also about the adverse social environments that children are growing up within. The lack of opportunity structures, the lack of role models, the lack of enrichment, unsafe streets and play areas. How do those adversities compound and contribute to the impacts that we're seeing later on? So when we think about the community environment, and I use this example from the Prevention Institute, we think about three dimensions equitable opportunities, we think about the actual built environment and the place, and then we think about the people who are there. I want to challenge you to think about what community trauma looks like and how it fits in to those three dimensions. So when we think about community trauma, we're thinking about intergenerational poverty, inescapable poverty, chronic unemployment and underemployment, constant social mobility, concentrated areas of disadvantage. We think about what happens when public spaces are deteriorated, unsafe, and just lack green space and beauty. We think about what happens to the social fabric of the community in terms of social cohesion, social capital and collective efficacy when you live in an unsafe environment with high levels of mobility and long-standing structural problems. 
So often when we talk about trauma and childhood adversities, we think very narrowly about the individual level, but we don't think about the broader level at which these adversities can take place and have really detrimental effects for so many children. So I'll give you an example. If you think about a violence that occurs within a community, such as a homicide or a shooting, when we think about how that impacts other children in the community, we often think about the children who may have witnessed that event, maybe a direct family member or friend of the victim, or somehow heard about that event. So don't think about those children. I'm asking you to think about the children who weren't even aware that the homicide took place. How does this affect them? Well, what does violence in a neighborhood do to a sense of trust and social cohesion among the people that live there? How does that impact dynamics within the family? How does that impact the level of stress that caregivers experience? And what does that do to their mental health and well-being and their parenting strategies? So if a 15-year-old does what a 15-year-old is going to do and not listen to their parents and go on Main Street, even though he told you 10,000 times not to go on Main Street, what is the penalty, what is the discipline if another 15-year-old was just killed on Main Street? So there's a dramatic impact that ultimately can affect not only parenting practices, but ultimately how children feel, their educational attainment, and their ability to be successful in life. My colleague at NYU looked at kids in New York City who took a standardized test. They all took the standardized test on the same day. They lived in neighborhoods that were identical in every other way, except one neighborhood had had a homicide and one did not. Those who lived in the neighborhood with the homicide scored lower on that standardized exam, state exam, that was within a month um, of the event. Simply that experience, that ripple effect, it wasn't that they all saw the homicide take place. So we know that these childhood adversities are contributing to major causes of morbidity and mortality. And we know that this risk is kind of abiding with children as they grow and develop into adulthood. Um, and it, it challenges us to think about what we can do to improve resilience. Now, before we get into resilience, I think it's important to acknowledge we all may have very different opinions about where resilience comes from. Is resilience something you're born with? Is it something that comes from the environment that you're, you're reared within? What builds resilience? What changes resilience? If we want to really think about how to help children thrive, this concept is one we have to wrestle with. So we live in a society that's had certain mythology about resilience. This is a statue of John Henry. So who is John Henry? <laughs> who knows? That's right, that's right. He took on the machine, right? And he, he, got, he, he beat the machine, but he died, right? Because the stress affected his heart. This is our American folklore mythology. And, you know, in a lot of ways, this is an interesting mythology because when we think about resilience, I want to encourage you to think about three different domains. This is an example from the industry literature. So when you think about resilience, think about the capacity to withstand future adversities, the capacity to recover from an adversity you suffered in the past, or the capacity to adapt to a state of on ongoing adversity. So the John Henry story is about withstanding. You know, if you can grow up here, if you can survive this, if you can you know, grit through it, you can do that anywhere in the world. That's what we like to say. And there's a, there's a truth in that, right? We've all had experiences that were challenging and we came out the other side with some real strengths. Um, however, there's also a scientific truth about what's happening too, because there's actually a, a, a terminology now in the public health literature called John Henryism. Sherman James, famous epidemiologist here in Michigan, um, explored these highly resilient individuals in the African American community and saw heart, higher levels of cardiovascular disease, 
higher levels of heart attacks, higher levels of chronic illness that went along with this strong resilience, high coping skills. We've looked at teenagers and young adults who are the highly resilient children who emerge out of really challenging stat status, go on to college and other things. We see early markers of cardiovascular disease in those young ones. So we know that this phenomenon can have benefits for the individual's progress, but it comes at a cost to them. And it really drives us to think about how do we build community factors that better support the outcomes of all children and what assets do we have to leverage so that children can withstand adversities. When we think about the dimension of recovery, recovery from a past adversity, we really want to think about opportunity structures within the neighborhood that allow it to prosper, feel safe, and feel healthy. Because a key part of recovering from adversity is the ability to reestablish a sense of safety and social connections. So every leader, Every caregiver needs to understand trauma and how it appears in children. We need advocacy skills to be able to tell the story of the healing process that children are undergoing. And so we need to develop and grow leaders in the community that can help support coordinated strategies. Finally, when we think of adaptation, there are children that I work with at Boston Medical Center who will not ever have secure housing. It's not because I don't believe we can arrange for affordable and secure housing. It's because the time it will take for us to do that, they will have grown from zero to 18. So I discharge about a third of the babies I see to homeless shelters or insecure housing situations. So I would describe that as a chronic adversity. Not having stable housing, moving, getting evicted, constantly being a paycheck away, that is an insidious stressor in the lives of families. How do we as a community address that? We have to set a North Star vision. We have to decide that's not acceptable. We have to decide that everyone needs shelter and not having shelter is an adversity. We have to learn how to tell that story. We have to retell that story because we've become so comfortable with children not having shelter, not having secure food, not having stable food. Um, so we as a group really have to transform spaces and environments that have caused a lot of pain, situations that have caused a lot of pain and create the opportunity for healing. Um, and that really requires us to begin to address structural barriers and think about how our policies and practices, whether intentioned or not, may have unintentional negative consequences for children. So we think about these community-based strategies, and we've talked a lot about how these systems of care all intend to build protective factors for families, but they have separate funding streams, and they're siloed. And we know trauma symptoms are an adaptation to your environmental circumstance. So all of us have to contribute to reestablishing safety and social protection. Uh, we need each other to really create a healing environment. So our work locally is very, very simple. We really work to create a space that allows community members and residents to work in a co-design model with community-based institutions and agencies. How do we create a mutual level table where everyone can contribute to the design at every single stage, transparent process. So we really focus on the community capacities we need to build to promote well-being and what contribution does a trauma-informed framework make to the existing good work that's already happening. So most of our partners are not mental health oriented, and they're not violence prevention oriented. They're the other folks working in the lives of young people who may benefit from incorporating a trauma-informed perspective. So an example would be school absenteeism. 
Well, if you use a trauma-informed lens, you would think of a range of different factors. If we think about community trauma, intergenerational trauma, historical trauma, think about a whole different range of factors that would contribute to absenteeism. And we would not say schools are on their own to figure out how to raise the level of absenteeism. We would see that it needs to be a comprehensive process. So we also work in a very, very simple way. We lead by listening. We expect that there are already good solutions and there's already good work happening in the community. And a key approach to sustainability is not to try and replace things, but to build upon those existing works. We really think about what are the highways for communication and collaboration. Usually our collaborations fall flat because of miscommunications or the lack of regular communication or the feeling like we're talking different language. <laughs> so we really try to break through those barriers in order to effectively collaborate. And then really try to take steps to lean in to more collective actions together. Um, so an example would be we have hubs of innovation in each of our communities. And these aren't giant hubs. We have a large network, but the hubs are tiny. There's nothing that's too small to be a hub of innovation. It could be one local library working with a laundromat in a different way. Non-traditional partners contributing to a shared existing effort to reach a broader group of families and to engage families in the decision-making process. These hubs, they seem really, really simple but they scale rapidly. And I think they scale rapidly because community members are really driving them. Community members are designing them and we're listening to community voice in a different way. And it's hard to do this on a huge scale. So we begin on a small scale and then we see the natural opportunities to grow. Another lesson learned is de it's, development is a two-way street. <laughs> and so we think about development everywhere. We love children. And so we're heavily focused on developmental trajectories for kids. But you know what? Parents and caregivers are also developing. <laughs> and we engage and embrace that. And our community leaders are also developing. So when we engage our community residents, we really view this as a developmental trajectory. Not that someone arrives done. And the community-based institutions that are at the table, they also have to develop too. We all have something to learn. We all have change. So this is um, a essential way of how everything is hosted and every invitation is that we're all on the developmental journey together leaning into that kind of childlike wisdom. I want to talk to you a little bit about that from a perspective of structural competency. Now, I don't mean cultural competency, which is very important. I mean structural competency. And this is a term my friend Helena Hansen has developed. Um, I'm going to show you, uh, with you an example because I think it's, it's more pertinent. Where is this picture from? When was it taken? Dust Bowl. Dust Bowl. Right? And can just people say what emotion, like what emotions are you seeing in the picture? Despair? Despair? Despair. Worry? Despair. Fear? Stress? Determination? You know, a family that's there together? But this is a, a difficult moment in the life of this family. And at the same point in time, we would never describe this mother without describing the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl, and the economic circumstance of the country at this time. That is a part of the story of this family. Now think back to last week or last month or the last time you engaged a family where you might have suspected maternal depression, you might have seen despair, you might have seen hopelessness. Did we think about the story of that family in the context of our current economic environment? Do we think about the story of the family in the context of community trauma, historical trauma, intergenerational processes? That's structural competency. 
Structural competency is taking what we see as a cultural phenomenon and, and talking about the structures that have been involved in this process. So it's making something that is otherwise invisible to us, visible, and it's a practice. So I'll say one more thing about it. I love going to the aquarium. I just love seeing like the tortoise and these humongous fish and you read, you know, it's just incredible. And you get the impression you are just watching what fish do underwater. This is how they live. But then you notice that actually there's a very thick glass and they actually are living in a very, very big fish bowl and it's a container. And we have to practice seeing the glass because that glass is actually dictating where the fish swim, what direction they swim every day and how they swim. So they're not making decisions independently. They are existing within a context. So a lot of times we'll say, well, I'm, you know, I'm a pediatrician, so what can I do about affordable housing? What can I do about food insecurity? I was trained to do a certain group of things. At the same point in time, we know that these systematic structural factors are violent towards families. They're affecting child development and growth. They're affecting child educational outcomes. They're affecting health. And we know that there's science to back that up. So we have to tell that part of the story. Even we can't get ourselves off the hook by saying that's not my purview, right? That's not my training. This is a really big part of our advocacy. So I practice seeing the glass. Whenever I'm looking at a circumstance or a situation, where do you see structures within it? Where are you seeing the impacts of policy? What is invisible to you, but that's affecting the behaviors of this family, this community, this school, this childcare center? When we start to do that more regularly, we start to think about ways to build resilience in a different way. So we know we have to invest early in caregivers, educators, and young children. But who are we missing? Who are we often missing when we're doing early childhood work? Maternal and child health, they call it in public health. Who are we missing? Yeah, parents. Actually, one, one half of the parent equation we're often missing. Thank you. <laughs> so we're often missing fathers. We have a whole prenatal care process that does not involve fathers. We screen for maternal depression. We screen for resources for mothers. Isn't the fact that a father might be depressed, an important thing as you're preparing to become a father. We just talked about childhood adversities. Where are the spaces that adult men can heal from witnessing intimate partner violence as a child, from child abuse that they may have experienced? Might it be a big trigger for you as you're about to become a dad for the first time, if you had a really difficult relationship with your dad. We know these things. We understand the science. We understand the patterns. It would not escape us to be able to start to build in supports for dads. So we see a lot of things, and we have a lot of names for when we don't see dads involved. <laughs> but do we see the contribution of social and childhood adversities to why these other behaviors may present. So this isn't new. This is something you all know. This is something we all intrinsically know. But collectively, we've decided not to do too much about it. <laughs> Same thing with teachers. And here I can expose myself. I introduced myself as someone who cares deeply about children's exposure to violence. I work as a pediatrician. I have kids of my own. 
To be honest, I hadn't really considered in the first part of my career what it felt like for the teacher, the kindergarten or first grade teacher who is taking care of the same child that I knew was deeply in pain, but spending the whole day with them, six to eight hours. What were the resources? What were the supports? Teachers are doing a heroic job and we need to step up and support them more because they are spending time stepping into a gap that our social policies have created because there should be so much more support for the work that teachers are doing and, and other professionals that are consistent in the lives of children who have very chaotic lives otherwise and very chaotic support. So it's really important for us to start to change, to look at things differently. <laughs> Finally, why fit in when you were born to stand out? <laughs> Dr. Seuss, childhood wisdom. So many of us are still learning <laughs> this, <laughs> right? But isn't life so much better when you stop trying to fit in and we, as a community, begin to embrace developmental continuum, differences, stop trying to label behaviors as normal, abnormal, all of those things. We, we embrace our differences. That was what we learned from the community attachment survey. That's what we know from working with children who people have discounted as being successful, who thrive when they have the right support and someone who takes an interest in them. Simple things, simple things. But our collective work cannot step away from this kind of simple principle because we really have to welcome those differences because sometimes people can be a little challenging. And sometimes we're not on speaking terms with someone. And sometimes we don't like how someone sent out that reminder, whatever it might be. These things happen in coalitions. We all get our feathers ruffled. We just have to have a different way of appreciating that we express our passion and our interests differently. And those tiny things can really get in the way. So just something to keep in mind. So. We really focus on leadership and the leaders are our villagers, just the members in the community. They're the people who will sustain, they're the people who will be there when all of this is gone. One of the models I'll share with you is our cluster model, which is focused on well-being of families. But we do some breastfeeding support, some attachment support. Most of the partners are not healthcare related intentionally. And this model has dramatically scaled and it has zero funding. The volunteers volunteer their time um, and they lead these cafes around the city. So who are these volunteers? Because parents are really busy and stretched and X, Y, and Z. Well, they're mission-driven people. And if we can get out of the way of dictating how everything is supposed to look, they lean in. They have a social justice orientation. They've had a set of experiences, some good, some bad. They want to help make sure other families have a better set of experiences. They have a desire to educate, but they have an equal desire to learn. And that distinguishes them from most service providers who have a desire to educate. That's more than your desire to learn from the people you're educating. They balance that much better, and so their success is much higher around engagement. They want to empower, they want to serve, and they have a strong sense of attachment to their community. My final point will be around data. This is a busy slide, but essentially we just tried to pull, pull a lot of data into a publicly shared dashboard. And we have it online, you can see it on our website. We're just getting started, but we have a lot of information there. So I'll give you a couple of examples of how we use this data to show bright spots as well as to show areas of need. So here we're looking at the Child Opportunity Index in a couple neighborhoods in, in, in Boston. Red is great, great opportunities, and blue is 
poor, very low opportunities. And this is Dorchester, one of the neighborhoods we work in with pretty low opportunities. Now the Child Opportunity Index factors in a number of census variables, and we've scoped this down to the block level, but a lot of variables around educational, health, and social opportunities. Here's the same map, the same place, looking at early childhood participation, and yellow is really low. So if you can look at our same community of Dorchester, although it's more homogenous in terms of low opportunity, there are some areas where there's actually some pretty high early childhood education participation and some areas that are low. But these areas with the dark red that are high, we explore. What are they doing? Why are they successful? Can we learn from them instead of developing something externally and bringing it in? So we seek out the bright spots and we use these maps to help us identify bright spots, places that are succeeding when the evidence says they should be not. <laughs> um, so we look for those. Um, we also work with community members to redesign. So our community members said food insecurity is a big issue. Um, so we mapped all of the places for free and low and low cost resources. And then we looked at the relationship between receiving food stamps, so if that's high, it's dark blue, and your access to fresh fruits and vegetables in farmers markets. And we find some areas that have low access, but they have high level of need. So then we can take this to our policy members and say, can we do something to help support a neighborhood that's being missed? Then we point out the bright spots, the areas with high need, but they're doing something really well. Can we learn what they've done and bring it to this community? Similar kind of, I'm, I'm going to skip this one because it's the same thing. The other thing that we found working with our very smart community members is they bring things to the table we never would have thought of. So these are the six A's, awareness, adequate, accessible, accurate, appropriate, and available. This was designed by our community members. They wanted to provide feedback on these dimensions to the free food and services that are received. So if you've ever received food from a food bank, but it had mites in it, that creates quite a problem in your home. Maybe someone gets sick or maybe mites spread. So they wanted to be able to also provide feedback when feedback is needed. So we're developing this app called the Abundance app that shares that. So I'm at time <laughs> and I'm at the end because ready by five, I want you to know you have already done it. And I actually didn't even know this until I saw the statue outside. But this community of Grand Rapids was the first city in the world, right? To fluorinate the water. <laughs> you did it. This is one of the 10 top 10 examples of a public health success, according to the CDC. And so interesting. When I talk about the work that we're doing around promoting child well being through these aligning networks, we say that it's like putting fluoride in the water. Everyone will benefit from this the kids at high risk, the kids that aren't at high risk, but everyone will benefit from this. So you've already done this. This is your history. You can claim that and take it to the bank that you can do massive social transformation here. Now we just have to do this around this social piece, the social determinants piece. Um, so when we put it all together, our courage cannot be individual courage. It has to be collective courage. Our conversations are a gateway to beginning to appreciate differences and to welcome them. Our connections must be intentional and focused on massive social change. You have put fluoride in the water. This work that you are doing now is fluoride in the water for school readiness. And it is exactly the same thing. And it's really a powerful approach that will benefit so many. So we are more than the sum of our parts working together. We are a different organism. Thank you so much for your time and attention this morning. <laughs>
Thank you, Dr. Renee. At this point, I'll mention again that we have uh, note cards on the tables and you can write questions. Uh, my colleague, Amy, in the Metro blue shirt is going to circle about and collect your questions. And at this point, I'll bring up our board member, Lynn Farrell, to um, facilitate the Q&A with Dr. Renee. Thank you. Thank you. Is this working? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Um, Good to see you again. Thank you. It's so great to hear that we are doing something well. That's great. Sometimes we do this work and we hit a little bit of battle fatigue. So it's uh, it's good to hear that we're we're on to something. We're on to something. Uh, you sort of began and ended with courage, and I think that's uh, that's sort of the through line through through all of this. We've asked our audience members to provide some questions for you. I'm going to try to stay on script and ask you those questions, even though I have like 10 of my own. <laughs> I'm going to stick with what Amory told me because I don't want to have to deal with her later. <laughs> OK. Uh, so the first question is, uh, what specific action would you recommend as a first step to develop community resilience for, one, policymakers, and secondly, service providers? That's a great, um, that's a great question. Uh, for policymakers, I would ask you, how do you engage with community voice? Do you have public hearings? Have you done things the same way for a long period of time? Focus groups, maybe some public hearings. Um, might you be able to reverse the roles? <laughs> So one of the things that happened locally in Boston is we had a series of listening hearings. So instead of the policymakers kind of reporting out to the community, the policymakers were there to listen to the community members form, elevating issues that otherwise might not get attention. So I would just encourage you to think creatively about doing something you've done perhaps totally in reverse to really allow the community to enter the space in a different way, a way you might not expect, and to see what happens from that. Um, I wonder about participatory budgeting. I wondered about shared governance, decision making. There's so many opportunities, and there's no place too small to begin. Mm -hmm. Who is the second Service group? providers. For service providers, I mean, I think the practice of, of you know, trying to build structural competency can be difficult for us as service providers because we often f feel like we don't want to open Pandora's box. If we can't solve it, we don't want to ex have it expressed and come out in the room. We have to begin to think about why that is the case. Why are we trained that way? Why is the thought about what a solution is limited to resource and problem solving? Because when we're talking about childhood adversities and healing from adversities, you're actually in a pretty powerful role because probably the biggest thing that hasn't happened for someone who's experienced childhood adversities has just simply been an acknowledgement from someone that this was a bad thing that happened and it wasn't your fault. Simple acknowledgement, listening, affirming that experience. That's something any of us could do. Um, and so we have to begin to rethink our strategies and why they are as they are. Um, what is problem solving really gaining? What's the goal of it? Thank you. Our next question is, can you talk a little more about uh, the non-traditional hubs? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Happy to share more about that. So what I'll share about that that, you know, isn't in a regular kind of talk is, um, I think before you can do non-traditional hubs, you have to be pretty honest. So for example, we did digital storytelling with parents, and we wanted them to talk about their experiences and perspectives on early childhood education. 
tell their own story, create a digital story, we'll share this broadly. Open invitation. So we're partners with the Boston Public Schools and the school system. One parent told a pretty hard story about the Boston Public School system, about how from the day her son was born, she made a beeline to try and get her son into a program that would allow him to go to school outside of Boston because of her bad experience there and the bad experiences of her nieces. So all the blood drained out of my body when I saw that story because that was going to be a hard story to share and I was afraid we were going to offend our strong partnership with the Boston Public Schools. So I learned in that moment, one, I had too much power because we should never have a process where ultimately I could veto one of the stories when we had opened it up for everyone to tell their story. So you have to be honest. <laughs> and if you start a process where you want to partner and engage with community voice, you have to be very honest about what the limits of that are going to be or what the, what the strengths of that are going to be. Um, but we didn't veto the story. We let it go. And it was just like, kind of like, hope everything's OK, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And one of the board members from the Boston Public Schools saw it, and she said, every board member should see this story because this is telling a parent's perspective in the right way. She had the opposite response to what I expected. I think some of the board members weren't happy with that story. But I think the biggest, the biggest thing is honesty and transparency. If you invite people to a table to contribute their ideas, and to help make decisions, be very clear about what you mean by help make decisions. Is it contribute ideas and then two of us are going to make the decision? Say that. <laughs> be honest. Um, so working relationships can really build trust when there's a lot of transparency and honesty. Thank you. Um, can you talk about uh, instances where police departments are modeling work to repair community after violent events? Yeah. So one thing that's happening, um, uh, I'll talk about two examples really quickly. One thing that's happening currently in Boston is there are police officers who, um, about a group of 12 that are assigned to schools just to be mentors, not to do security, not to do policing, um, not to do scared straight kind of stuff, just to be adult male mentors <laughs> um, and to get to know some of the children and for the children to get to know them. And I think just being in space together and developing a sense of safety is really important. Um, a next step we're going to do with that is actually shared stories where a child will write their story and a police officer will write their story and then they'll exchange it. Mm -hmm. So each person will read the other's story. So another level of depth and kind of walking in someone else's shoes. <laughs> um, another thing we do with the local police department um, through one of our partners, Child Witness to Violence Project, is a lot of work about response to family violence. <laughs> um, so police officers are often the first responders to a very traumatic event for children. So they are anxious to understand more about trauma and understand more about what they can do to reduce um, additional traumas for kids. So um, really being able to provide access to information as well, too. Um, Thank you. Um, this one is um, uh, many people facing adversity try to hide, try mm -hmm. to hide that and keep a strong face. How do we help reach out to everyone uh, just in case they're, they're trying to be uh, too proud? That's a great question. So um, I would say one of the strategies we encourage is, um, has everyone heard of universal precautions? Like every time you change tech, check blood, you put on gloves, right? Because you just don't know. Um, and so uh, we can take the same type of approach to using a trauma-informed practice. Usually you don't know what people have experienced. And even if you know some of their story, you just know some of their story. And so if you take a uniform, a universal approach to trauma-informed practices, that means the folks who answer the phones, the, the nurses, the doctors, every member of the support staff team, 
Same thing in schools, the receptionists, the family visitors, um, the educators, the principals, everyone is exposed to trauma-informed practices and uses them universally. You don't turn them on and turn them off for a special family because you will miss families that absolutely need your support um, and you'll miss kids that absolutely need your support. We all know that when we look at kids, actually it's kids who are having externalizing behaviors and behavioral problems that get a lot um, more resources and supports because it can be disruptive um, in other social environments. But I worry very much about the kids that are quiet, that are internalizing, the kids that leave the room when things get chaotic, right? Um, um, the kids that kind of shut down, shut off. They're actually suffering just as much, but we're not seeing it. Um, I would just add to that question. Someone once said, um, you know, our silences are making us sick, you know? And I think there's a lot of truth in that, but everyone is on their own journey. And so I am not a strong advocate of like kind of a mandated type of screening that requires people, you know, disclose a number of things they're not comfortable disclosing or that information be shared broadly. I think we have to do it in a much more strengths-based way. Thank you very much. We're, very, we're hoping that we have access to the PowerPoint that you provided today. Uh, but we'll work with Anne Maria on that. And we will work hard as we continue our, our journey here in, in West Michigan to see the glass. Please help me thank Dr. Renee. Thank you. Thank you.